So a lot of what we do here at Trainer Road is, I mean, all of what we do is focused on improving performance on the bike. And we do a lot of that in terms of interval training and focusing on that. That's obviously what the product's all about. But um, on the podcast, we get a ton of questions from people on about every aspect of performance. And one aspect that all of us felt like we could improve on was bike handling. And all of us are in three totally different positions with that. Um, I'm known, at least on our podcast and the podcast listeners, I'm known as like, you know, the proficient bike handler. Nate, you're I'm known. Less so. Yes. yes. A bit. <laughs> yeah. And Chad, you used to race mountain bikes, haven't raced them in a long time. Technology's changed. The bikes are 100% different. So much different. Um, but all three of us, we decided to, to deep dive into this and we brought in a hired gun that was a smart guy and knows exactly what he's doing with this. Uh, Lee McCormick from Lee Likes Bikes. I went from almost quitting mountain biking to being super excited about mountain biking just over a weekend. Let's go over some of the principles that we learned uh, and to attach some context to us. So then hopefully people can get some, an idea of how they can apply this and get faster. The basic idea is that like you, you want your knee to be in the middle of your base of support or behind, never in front of the base. Does that make sense? And so on a bicycle, if you're in a high hinge, your knees are behind the base. See that? Behind the bottom bracket. Mm -hmm. If you're in a low hinge, they're right above the bottom bracket. If you're in a bad squat position, they're in front. I've noticed a big trigger for bad times on the trail mm -hmm. or in any circumstance, it's when my knees go forward. Yep. That's the problem. He also said too that, you know, cross country racers, like you said, will be up like that. But for me, since I was new, he's like, don't do that. Like, just stay in the, the position, like the, the correct position with the hip, like a deep hinge when you're going downhill. When I would get better, you can be more efficient. And then they said the best riders would just drop into that position for a second go over the bumpy terrain, absorb it, and come back out. More here, less, less here. Like, like tire, draw your ribs down. So when you're in that hinge, you should not be able to see your belly. It should be behind your shoulders. Oh, so not low enough? Yeah, exactly. Right. Like this. Oh, look forward. It's better. That's about right. That was pivotal. I mean, finding that, that position on the bike, because bending over is one thing, but all we do in that case is load up our quads and then our weight's really forward. But when he showed us that hinge position that was more akin to a deadlift than a squat, and the whole hips glided back, the whole body went with it, yet we still could maintain that low position, it was a total game changer. And by the end of that second day, my hamstrings have never hurt so much in my life. Even doing like heavy deadlifts. Same here. It's like, pretty rough. It was amazing. Yeah. And I could actually tell on the trail I would, I would say I'm not in the right position because I can't feel the stretch in my hamstrings. So here we go. Arms are dead straight, core is on. We're gonna hinge. This is the shred lift. So this is exactly what you'd be on this deep downhill, right? Where's my weight? On your bottom rack on your feet. Exactly. And this is kind of convenient because if I push my weight forward, what does it do? Mm -hmm. yeah. And if I push my weight back, Right? Yeah. So if the deck is level, I'm centered. And you think about it, it makes perfect sense, right? The center of where your body should be on a bike. You're not weighting your bars. The weight's through your legs, right? Mm -hmm. And it's over the bottom bracket, which is the center of the bike. It makes the bike stable. It makes it so that your weight is distributed lower. Another thing I want to bring up is with the, putting the weight through the pedals in the bottom bracket and how the bike is weighted. I kept going back to that is, I would think for my hands, am I pulling on the bars or I'm too far back? Mm -hmm. Am I putting too much weight on the bars? Like my, like, you know, through my hands. Yeah. And I would think, oh, I have to put the weight through my feet. Put my weight through my feet and adjust my position. Then I would be in that position and be able to absorb a lot more. And the level of my fear, you know, I would go from a, a 12 out of 10, yeah. right? Instantly down to a seven or eight, which is like where fun happens, It's a right? substantial drop, yeah. yeah I just, noticed, just noticed right the there. same thing. The confidence is just like there, just mm -hmm. right, right away. So that, that more or less put us, like that gave us the foundation. Mm -hmm. uh, he calls it the base of support. That gave us a foundation from which we could work on and, and then actually start getting dynamic with the position that we are in on the bike. He talks about it in terms of rowing and anti-rowing. Mm -hmm. And he basically boils down every situation that you could come across on a mountain bike. Boom, and we're just going to like, do this very simple row. Anti-row. In a simple way, this is going up things, 
This is going downstream. So we rode pump tracks. Uh, we rode some jump lines. We rode berms. We rode drops. We did a lot of different things. And I kept realizing all this is, is a row or an anti-row or a combination of the both. Um, but we should probably explain what they are first. Um, on the row side, just like if you're on a rowing machine and you're pulling back, right? A row is when you are pulling the bike back and, and also up. And then an anti-row is the opposite of that, when the bike is going forward and consequently down as well. I should say the front end of the bike. But what's key there is it's, a, it's not a push and a pull, which basically just takes place in the arms. It's a row and an anti-row, which involves basically the whole body, but especially the hips. Every row or anti-row that we do from now on should start from the hip. We don't have as much power from our arms. We're relying on a, on a structure that isn't as strong. That's gonna be really difficult for us to, to actually move the bike like we need to. But if we start in the hips and with a bunch of power, we can get super explosive movements or at least controlled movements that way. And we learned to utilize rowing to go up, whether it's a ledge, we went up a ledge in this case or a rock, but going up roots, going, if you're in a situation where you think, oh, that's a really tricky line that I'll have to negotiate, maybe you can just row your way up the whole thing and skip those tricky lines. Mm -hmm. It was interesting to think of rowing in that perspective to help yeah. you go up, uphill quicker. There's two parts of it. One is when you hit small roots going up, you can just, bam, hit each one, lose a couple watts, hit each one, lose a couple watts, or you can row up each one a little bit, save a couple watts, and gain like, you know, 10 seconds on a climb, which in racing is a lot. It is. There's other things that you can't roll over, which I think the video doesn't do it justice again, but Jonathan went up this crazy rock where if I were to go into it with my technique, I would have just bam face right into it, a face plant into it. But you had to go and at, you got a lot of speed, but then you and Lee both did it. You rode hard, ro rode, yeah. R-O-W, yeah. rode hard and went up and over the rock on something that I would have Honestly, I didn't think you were going to make it. Right. Like I, I was watching that. And I'm like, oh, I'm glad we're having this on camera because I thought you were going to crash. <laughs> and I wouldn't be the only one who crashed that day. So it's just, it's just so like, I, I wouldn't think of that, that you could use those on an uphill climb, that same motion, the row motion. And I think that's where a lot of professional cross country racers will drop a lot of people uh, with less power actually. Yep. And basically, if you think about it, your feet are fixed to the bottom bracket, your hands are fixed to the bars, and basically what you're doing is you're leveraging that bike up, right? Up so it can go over something. Unloading it, mm -hmm. effectively. And then at, at the top of that, once you're doing that, in most cases, unless you're just jumping up something or dropping off something, you're going to want to then do the opposite, which is that anti-row uh, down the back side of something. Mm -hmm. And on a pump track, this is really cool because it's like an instant reward system. Yeah. You find out if you did it right or not just by the feeling that you yeah. have. You can totally feel it. And I would go through on the pump track session after session and I'd get like three of the 10, whatever, how many were bumps right. Yeah. And then I would say, Lee would try to talk to me and I'm like, nope, I gotta go. I gotta go. Cause I could feel the ones that, when you do it wrong, you can feel it. And then you want to, do it over and over again because it feels so good. You get in that, what he calls that flow state. Get in touch with it. Yeah, it feels amazing when you do it right. When you yeah. do it wrong, you can totally feel it. Yeah, and something that I had made a mistake, you know, I was, I, I was decent enough to get by on a pump track. I could carry momentum. I didn't have to pedal on most pump tracks. It was just fine. But something that I was doing was I was basically like thinking up, down, up, down so up when the jump goes up then down when it goes down and i was trying to time it so that i was like just before it you know mm -hmm. but one thing that i would get especially if it was smaller bumps or bumps that were came in rapid succession is i would my bike would be unweighting too much and i would lose rhythm and i also wasn't getting nearly as much speed as other people were getting through those sections so instead of up and down when we're talking about rowing and anti-rowing it's more like fore and aft with what we're doing with our bars. It's like a circular motion. Exactly. Yeah. That's it's, hence the row and not the push and pull. Learning to row or to anti-row uh, separately, they're, they're effective, but learning to do them together, I feel like is key for a couple things. So first of all, like you said, uh, when we're going over terrain, uh, it allows us to maintain more momentum and control, which is an important key, mm -hmm. because if you're going really fast into something and, and you're not rowing or anti-rowing to be able to absorb and use that shape, that shape is gonna make you fly off and possibly lose control. It also, I noticed, really helped when we were going through sections of trail that had a lot of, almost like a puzzle that you couldn't unlock. It would have a lot of chunk or roots or something like that. 
suddenly you saw the whole trail in like a different language. Like you yep. saw spots where you could. Yeah, and that was another point flow. that he really pushed was connecting the shapes. And that's the, frame, or the, the term he kept on using. And, and at first it didn't really click with me. And then over time, you start looking a couple moves ahead and stringing things together before you've gotten there. And again, I mean, it helps you find a rhythm better. It helps you employ that row, anti-row motion. And, it, and again, just yeah, another game changer. Going through that motion, that pattern, like so many times in a row, um, it helped me a lot to first get it. And I'm assuming that if I use it even more, it'll become more ingrained, that movement yes, pattern. I mean, we were employing those on everything, everything from jumps that were big and even pushing our limits to uh, things like drops. And basically the anti-row is really helpful when you're going over something off something like yeah. a drop. And what it's are the key. It really is, it's a right? Big deal. Because yeah. especially when the drop gets taller and you go over it, I mean, if you stop and think about it, it, it can turn into a pretty sketchy situation if your front end drops down and you end up going over the bars. Usually our response, and my response has always been, I just need to hit things with more speed. And if I hit it with more speed, I can kind of carry off and then hopefully land in the right position. That's that's a more natural yeah. response, I think, is to just yeah. get over For it. some people. Get away from it. <laughs> my natural response is to when I see that, is to hit the brakes and lean back. Away which, from the danger. Which is, and then I get pulled over, and then I get sucked in, and then I flip over. Whereas now we learned how to, how to anti-row over those things, how to you know, drive the bike down, keep the bike in contact with the ground, which maintains such a higher level of control. Yes. Because if we were to jump off those things, then what comes next, we're already, we're in a bad state. Yeah. Whereas if you roll that and the bike tires are in contact with the ground the whole time, you have so much more control for whatever comes next. Yeah, that's And true. that was yet again, a really big takeaway. I, I was breaking all wrong. You were too. Completely. Yeah, that's that's right. why my brakes were heating up. I was getting the squeal in my rotors. Yeah. And I, and I thought, oh, I just got bad rotors. Why doesn't this happen to anybody else? Yeah. It's because I was on the brakes the whole time and just basically dragging my wheels, no traction, no control, just fighting the entire descent. So my takeaway was, is and he had us do these drills at the uh, Truckee Bike Park, is to, the drill was to unweight your bike and then as your bike pushes down in the ground, brake. Yes. And we practiced that in the gravel a few times and it took me actually a little while to get it. It feels kind of weird, but the idea is once you've doubled your body weight, you have more traction, right? So it's easier to slow down. And then I then took that to the, um, there's some slalom runs on the pump track. And before what I would do, I'd see something scary coming up and I immediately get on my brakes and kind of softly do it and try to scrub off speed. Mm -hmm. yeah. But then a lot of times my bike would be unweighted because of the way that the, the trail goes up and down and I would lose traction, right? So now what I would do is I would see something scary coming up and I knew I was going to go back into a motion of, of downforce in about a second from now. So I would wait that second. And that was so hard for my brain to say, wait a second to brake. But then I would brake more first forcefully. I would drive the, it through my pedals, right? He taught us that about doing it at the right angle. Yeah. I'd have much more traction. I'd scrub up more speed faster. So I kind of carry more speed. You brake later and harder into the turn, yeah. but it actually d felt better. I could brake, still be fast, brake when I needed to, still be fast, rather than just go slower, 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 and lose control over the entire course of the descent. The, the way that I was thinking about it in my mind was placing your braking appropriately. And, when you, and where you place the braking is, of course, relative to where the turn is, relative to your speed, but it's also relative to the terrain coming into it. And you might have really big braking bumps or sequential drops into a turn, right? It changed my mindset to look at that as, okay, so I have two cascading bumps into this turn, uh, big drops, let's say. So that means when I drop off the first one and I land, that will be a down motion and I will place a lot of braking and I will scrub my speed. And then the next one, there's a big braking bump coming into that turn. Like, you know, a lot of turns will get a bump coming into it. That's a good opportunity for you to place braking there. When you're going down any trail, you should always be looking for and making those shapes. You should be creating them if they aren't there. If it's pan flat, you can still be waiting and unwaiting into a turn and therefore create this better braking effect. And that, I almost want to say that was the single most important thing that I took away from that whole thing. It's hard to, because there were several things that were just so key, I made such a big deal, and every time I employ them, it's like, wow, I can't believe I didn't know that before. Right. But that one in particular changed my riding, I think, more than anything else. Um, one thing I want to talk about is, you said going into some of these berms that we did at North Star, there is a, uh, a braking bumps, yes. right? And what Lee told us, which is I wasn't entering the turns wide enough, 
and I was doing whatever the sheeple line was. So there is a line in the, in the trail, he calls it the sheeple one, where everyone just goes, and that's usually where the braking bumps are too. But we practiced the North Star, we had a kind of like an S-turn berms, coming in extremely wide. And I did that one a few times. <laughs> this, this is pushing some bounds, because he made us go so high up on that berm, I was like, I half expected the berm to break off and me to slide through exactly. it. Exactly, and I was before, I would, I would go low, right? And there'd usually too at North Star, there'd be like this, this like six inch pit right yeah. in the low spot because so many people would come in right there and yeah. break and that then breaks up and gets dusty and it blows out yeah. but when we went high man i felt so much better and you get this is maybe the the only time i'm trying to get better at this i felt that row anterior row weight on weight so i'd come into the turn one way wait on it unweight come over the other turn wait on it come through the turn and feel awesome and that is that i think jonathan correct me if i'm wrong that's the way to ride mountain bikes it really is so to recap, uh, really it's, it starts at the feet and that's where your weight's placed. And from there up, you wanna make sure that your knees are in that right position. Uh, we're not talking about going in front of that center of, of weight where you have that base of support, right? Uh, hinging at the hips is the key. And then that allows you to then be in a position to effectively row and anti-row through any sort of terrain that you come across and provides greater control. Um, and, it, and these principles helped all three of us. All three of us are in starkly different positions. In a weekend. Yep. And massive, massive improvements for all of us. So it was, it was educational for us. Um, I feel like these are the type of principles and that, that would be helpful for plenty of people. But I believe that uh, something that it behooves us to say and it's actually necessary to say is all three of us agreed that having an educated eye, a different perspective was key with this because we feel like we're doing it right but Every we're not we doing it right, yeah. <laughs> you know, and having somebody that knew exactly what to look for. And could effectively process. communicate, tell us what we were doing wrong, put it in ways we could understand individually and then apply. And that was huge. Very impressive stuff. Very impressive. Uh, apply, hopefully people can apply these things and get faster on their own too. Great.